to talk about uh, diffusion from convection. Okay. Yeah, uh, so first of all, uh, I would really like to thank the organizers for the invitation and also for uh, ingenuity uh, in organizing this conference. Uh, and uh, I'll discuss uh, basically how uh, diffusion can emerge from convective or uh, ballistically propagating modes, uh, which is the work I did together with uh, Jacopo and Takato. Um, so, okay. Um, the, the, the motivation behind uh, doing this, uh, this uh, study is basically centuries old, so trying to understand microscopic of origins of uh, transport coefficients, so how normal transport, ideal transport arises and what are really the kind of the physical properties of the system that influence it. And <clears throat> the thing that we wanted to do um, is basically tell something about uh, these quantities without um, referencing or without dwelling into the intricate integrability structure such as uh, form factor expansion. So, and uh, the reason for trying to do that is uh, that possibly we might hope that uh, applicability of the method that we uh, developed uh, goes beyond integrable systems, maybe also beyond the single dimension, but also to reflect uh, somehow from more physical perspective um, about some results that were previously derived uh, in integrable systems. So um, at this point, I was also would also like to uh, mention uh, the work from Ben. Uh, where he uh, puts uh, some of the ideas I will present in a more uh, formal and more rigorous uh, framework. Um, so let me start by first discussing a couple of basic ingredients which basically underlie uh, our, um, our approach uh, without going into too, too many technical details. So the basic idea as was the case in many preceding talks, um, is to somehow take a hydrodynamical limit. So, and the way we do it is basically take, uh, let's say, an infinite system, divide it into small but still large cells, um, and then look at what's happening uh, to local operators that extend throughout these so-called fluid or hydrodynamical cells. So basically, these are the operators that are just sums of some local or quasi-local densities over these hydrodynamical cells. Um, and an assumption that is usually used, that was also uh, used uh, uh, on Monday uh, at many instances, is uh, so-called assumption of local equilibration, uh, where one assumes that locally the system, after long enough time, is described by some uh, generalized Gibbs ensemble um, where um, the description should be correct uh, if one includes all of the quasi-local uh, conserved quantities. So one of the main uh, properties of GGS is actually a clustering property uh, which basically tells us that uh, if uh, you're considering some local properties which are encoded in uh, local observables uh, basically, you don't need to care what the, the value of chemical potentials is uh, far away from your hydrodynamical cell. Um, but this intuition expands from just local uh, expectation values also to local uh, uh, connected correlation uh, functions. Um, and one can actually pro prove if one considers uh, endpoint connected correlation function that basically we can forget um, uh, well uh, that, that we can forget about all of the connected correlation functions um, that do not include quantities that are all localized at a single hydrodynamical cell there are of course uh, corrections due to the boundaries so of course at boundaries there will be one over L corrections if L is the size of your hydrodynamical cell. Um, so uh, the second 
notion that is very important uh, and was uh, uh, well uh, was basically already introduced on Monday by Takato is uh, is a notion of normal modes. Uh, so normal modes are just some excitations on top of uh, a homogeneous background. So you just take, say, thermal state, then you excite some local excitation, and then you look what's happening. And as Takato nicely explained, what starts happening is that you see many peaks propagating uh, throughout your system. Uh, and basically how you can identify normal modes, you just uh, look at uh, the packets that are uh, traveling with the different velocities and usually they are also spreading in some way either diffusively or super diffusively um, and uh, how one can obtain uh, uh, these normal modes is just by diagonalizing uh, the Druden matrix which is uh, the time average current current autocorrelation function uh, also, the eigenvalues of this Druder matrix not only gives us uh, the combinations of uh, conservation loss corresponding to the normal modes, but uh, also the velocities with which they are propagating through our system. Um, so the second important quantity, which will be at the center of my discussion, uh, is the Onsager matrix, uh, which carries more information than just the Druder weight. Uh, it tells us how these peaks that are propagating through our system are spreading in time. So uh, basically it tells us what the uh, width of this spread is. Um, and in particular, if this quantity is finite, uh, I should also mention that uh, uh, the Onsager matrix is connected to diffusion matrix uh, through the Einstein relation, so just by susceptibility of charges. Uh, so, and if diffusion matrix and Onsager matrix are finite, of course, uh, transport is, uh, well, okay, the spreading is diffusive. Uh, but these two quantities are also directly related to what I motivated my talk with. So, the, the uh, transport coefficients, namely through the weight, uh, tell us about ideal conductivity while Onsager matrix. Uh, tell, tell us about uh, normal uh, conductivity uh, in our system. Um, so the primary uh, idea behind uh, obtaining the results, which I'll show to you, uh, is something that we call hydrodynamic uh, expansion. Um, and the idea is to try to identify uh, the modes um, or the operators in some sense, the operators on the level of correlation function, but this is already technical. So let's say just to identify some operators uh, which survive the hydrodynamical limit. So where we send the size of our hydrodynamical cells to infinity. Um, and of course, uh, the operators that survive such a limit are uh, quasi-local conserved quantities because uh, uh, they are actually conserved in the system. So if you increase it, um, that their value will not uh, decrease. Um, so what we did is we basically take a current, in some sense, a current operator. We, we, we say, okay, we will look at what this current operator does to some uh, density matrix. Um, and basically what we do is, oh, sorry. Uh, is just expand the current operator in uh, this equilibrium state uh, in terms of uh, these quasi-local densities, which also depend on the position of this uh, of our hydrodynamical cell. Uh, in particular, uh, what turns out to be important is the first order in this expansion and the second order in this expansion, at least for what we want to do. Um, there, there are also higher order terms, but one can show that they will not be important. And there is all, only a remainder, um, and I will kind of, um, uh, for most of the talk, I'll forget about this remainder. I'll only comment about it in the conclusion. So one can um, uh, look at this uh, hydrodynamical expansion also as expanding uh, the density matrix uh, around some 
homogeneous stationary density matrix uh, um, in terms of uh, local or quasi-local densities of charges. Um, so after one does this uh, expansion, one can simply take the expression for, say, through the weight uh, matrix uh, and insert the expansion in, into the definition. Um, and uh, what we actually can see is that the only contribution that is non-zero is the first order in this expansion when we are considering uh, through the weights. And uh, we, we were actually able to reproduce a well-known result, uh, which is obtained from hydrodynamical projection or Mazur bound, which basically tells us, so you can see here, um, it tells us that uh, drew the matrix is equivalent to the products of uh, overlaps of charges and currents, and then there should be an inverse of susceptibility matrix. Um, but one can, of course, always choose a nicer basis, uh, and in particular, probably the nicest basis is a normal mode basis, which has a diagonal and a normalized susceptibility matrix. So in the normal mode basis, uh, drew the weight is simply equivalent uh, to the projection of current J, so JK uh, here and here, onto the uh, conservation law uh, NK. Uh, okay, here there should be some other index. So uh, this K is not the same as this K, sorry for this. Um, and yeah, we should also project the second current to to to, um, to normal modes, and this gives us uh, the the weight. Um, so, what's important here is basically that we have obtained some information about the dynamics in our system uh, from considering purely uh, statical uh, quantities such as uh, susceptibility or. Uh, overlaps of the currents with our normal modes. Um, but we can play a similar game uh, by considering Onsager matrix. So asking ourselves, okay, how will this, um, uh, these peaks that are propagating through our system spread with time? Um, and it, it, it proves uh, to be useful to redefine a bit our current basically taking away uh, the ballistic contribution of our current. And if we do this, the Onsager matrix takes a relatively simple form. So we can play a similar game once again and obtain a result which is a bit more complicated. Um, but in some sense, what's important is that uh, actually from this result, one can uh, see the relation to uh, the theory of nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics, which on which I'll comment more uh, later on. Uh, but once again, if we go to this nice normal mode basis, uh, the uh, um, Onsager matrix uh, is simply equivalent to the projection of the current onto the products of conservation laws divided by the difference of their velocities. Okay, here I should comment that uh, we're not claiming that this is a full Onsager matrix in general, uh, because we only took uh, into account the part of our hydrodynamical expansion coming from uh, the expansion of the density matrix or the current operator with respect to densities of local conservation laws. In principle, the, uh, what could come into play is less local conservation laws, but uh, uh, for now we don't care about it. So um, let's see how far actually uh, this result took us. Well, I should also mention that this result is quite nice as well because uh, basically we get the information, some part of the information in general, uh, about how the uh, so about how this normal mode spread simply by diagonalizing the drew the weight uh, matrix which tells us just about the velocities and the, the structure of these normal modes so we see that uh, uh, we we can learn um, some, some finer detail about the dynamics uh, 
or already from just from through the weights. Um, okay, so uh, let me now uh, clarify how our result uh, manifests itself uh, in different setups. Um, namely, there were quite a few results uh, that preceded our study. Um, so the first uh, bound on uh, diffusion constant, as far as uh, I know, uh, was won by Tomasz in 2014, where he lower bounds uh, the diffusion constant, in particular the spin diffusion constant, uh, by quadratically extensive uh, conserva conserved quantities. Uh, and indeed, uh, one can make a natural connection with our study because as I showed you before, um, what, what we have here is basically the, the products of conservation loss, which is a quadratically extensive quantity. So because N is quasi-local, the, the product of two quasi-local is actually quadratically extensive. But uh, one, one can even make a, a, a quantitative connection uh, with this result. And then there was also a, a result which connected the uh, diffusion constant or lower bound of the diffusion constant by the curvature of the, the root away. And once again, in special uh, cases, uh, one can immediately see this, uh, this result from our study. So, um, so the, the, the systems that are under the most scrutiny in this uh, conference are uh, integrable system systems. And in integrable systems, uh, the exact expression for the uh, diffusion, uh, diffusion constant or Onsager matrix uh, has been obtained uh, using the thermodynamical, uh, thermodynamic form factor expansion um, and also via a kinetic approach. Um, and what we can show is that actually uh, the expression that we obtained uh, saturates uh, the uh, Onsager matrix, which was exactly computed in integrable systems, which means that the only contribution to diffusion constant or to Onsager matrix actually comes from the fluctuations of uh, local conservation loss. So the second order expansion uh, of our current or our of or of our density matrix in terms of densities of conservation loss. Um, okay, th there is a, a, a further insight that we got from this result, which is understanding a pecu peculiar uh, relation between diffusion constant, which we observed uh, a year and a half ago, between diffusion constant and uh, due the self weight. So the diffusion constant was shown to be, for some cases, connected to the curvature of the due the self weight. Um, and indeed, if one uh, analyzes our result uh, in a bit more detail, one sees that this will happen whenever um, one of the normal modes, so whenever, um, um, so when the requirement for this overlap between the current and the products of two normal modes, uh, for it to be non-zero um, is, uh, some let's say symmetry restriction which fixes one of the velocities to zero so if this is the case then uh, what we claim is that uh, the diffusion constant is uh, uh, equivalent to the through the self weight which is um, a particular quantity similar to through the weight where instead of taking uh, integral uh, time average of uh, uh, current current autocorrelation function, one just looks at the current current autocorrelation function locally. Uh, so finally, um, there is also a relation to the nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics, which uh, which has uh, actually been uh, an inspiration uh, for 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 doing this. Uh, um, doing this study and uh, in particular performing uh, the expansion of the current. Um, but before um, I, I, I tell you a couple of words uh, about nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics, 
uh, let me just mention uh, KPZ equation, which was already um, presented uh, for integrable and non in in in, uh, in, uh, in scope of integrable and non integrable models uh, on Monday by Vir and Jacopo. Um, and what's important, uh, the important point, one of the important points uh, about this equation is uh, that it, it actually corresponds to uh, the universality class, which is not diffusive. So it's super diffusive, which means that uh, the spreading of your normal modes is faster than, uh, in, than in the diffusive case. Um, and uh, what, what has been observed uh, historically is that uh, actually um, anomalous behavior uh, emerges in numerous uh, classical uh, one-dimensional systems, in particular uh, unharmonic oscillators and so on. Um, and this has been explained by Herbert uh, with nonlinear fluctuate in hydrodynamics, so uh, which well, one of the statements, probably uh, the, the simplest one one can make is uh, if there are no symmetry restrictions, if we are away from any special point, and if we have a, uh, a conservation law, uh, one dimensional systems will exceed its super diffusive behavior. Um, and the way one obtain th obtains this uh, is in a spirit uh, very similar uh, to what uh, uh, we have done uh, so uh, it's basically expanding the expectation value of the current uh, in terms of uh, conservation laws uh, in stationary states up to the second order uh, and then adding some uh, phenomenological noise and uh, diffusion uh, which was already uh, discussed by Jacopo uh, last week um, and one can see that basically what we get if this g which is just the second order expansion of the current with respect to the conservation laws is non-zero uh, is something that's essentially kpz equation um, so uh, if this is the case uh, uh, nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics uh, predicts the divergence of the diffusion constant but even more, it uses the dynamical exponent. Um, but also, if we look at our result, uh, we can see that whenever we have, so let me go back to uh, our equation. So whenever we have two normal modes, let's say, uh, which have a non-zero overlap with the current, and they have, provided that they have the same velocity, we see that this expression will actually be divergent. So uh, everything works out uh, consistently. Um, and uh, so and this, so let me stress again, and this result is not, uh, not uh, specialized to, to, to just integrable systems. So it holds also for non-integrable systems. Okay. Um, so uh, let me uh, now go back to, to, to our expansion and uh, basically um, uh, well, make an overlook of what I hope can be done in these directions. That in this direction. So the first question um, that was kind of put under the rug is: uh, What are the other contribution to contributions to diffusion constant? Uh, and it's clear that there should be other contributions to diffusion constant. In particular, um, if we consider models with zero through the weight, then the convective contribution to the diffusion constant, so the expression, the main expression that I was showing you, is zero. Uh, but we know that uh, in general, when we have non-integrable models, at least uh, we should expect uh, diffusive behavior. So there should also be other mechanisms giving rise to uh, diffusion uh, in non-integrable models, at least. Um, so one option is that uh, there are some quadratically extensive conserved quantities, uh, which are not uh, so, somehow simply related to local uh, conservation laws, because uh, even if you take uh, some generic model, usually 
uh, symmetry restrictions will actually tell you that uh, the convective contribution to diffusion, if you are making products of your con local conservation law, will give you exactly zero. So there might exist some quadratically extensive quantities which are not simply given by, uh, by the products of two local conservation laws, which might give rise to diffusion in non-integrable systems or even noisy systems. Um, another question, which is, I guess, more straightforward, is uh, to address the question of a uh, higher cumulants of the current. So we are able to uh, obtain uh, through the weight, obtain some contribution to the diffusion constant. Are there contributions to 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 to, to higher cumulants of the current? Um, and finally, it would be very nice to go uh, beyond one one dimension, um, in particular, at least to, 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 to the flatland, to the two-dimensional world, um, because we know that there are, um, first of all, a couple of very interesting results coming from ADS-CFT, uh, some universal bounds um, on diffusion. Um, and secondly, uh, transport in two-dimensional systems is also uh, related to one of the uh, greatest uh, questions in condensed matter physics, even which is uh, high temperature superconductivity. Okay, so um, with this, I would like to uh, finish and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, uh, are there any questions? We have, yeah, let's say three minutes for questions. Just uh, unmute yourself and ask. So can I ask? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm Lorenzo here. Yeah. So very naively, um, is there maybe any way where you can use this expansion of the reduced density matrix in terms of uh, quasi-local conservation laws to compute uh, one-point functions in given uh, an equilibrium steady state, say? In uh, equilibrium or? Uh... Well, I mean, so any, say Heisenberg chain, you want to compute local one point function, say sigma x, j, sigma x, j plus one. Um, because this uh, is- a Well, in, in principle, you would have to, um, I mean, uh, I, what, what I was uh, assuming here is that you can uh, anyway compute the, the overlaps of currents with charges. Uh, and in particular, that would mean if you wanted to calculate uh, expectation values that you have to calculate also the overlaps, which which is even harder, right? But uh, I mean, so in this case, I, I guess that the most of overlaps will be simply zero because I mean, all local conservation. Well, I mean, so I just w was wondering because this is a, a different, a difficult problem if you address it directly. So maybe your method allows us to give some idea. Um, I mean, I don't think it makes uh, calculating the expectation values. Uh, you, you mean not the dynamics, it's just... Uh, no, no, expectation value, either thermal states or GGE states. Uh, no, it doesn't simplify it. I mean, uh, and, uh, I mean uh, calculating expectation values is basically zero order in our expansion. Right. Um, so I think, I mean, um, I don't think you can profit anything uh, from Thanks. this analysis. Thanks. Other questions? Uh, uh, hi, Marco. Could I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah of course. Um, so the divergence of the diffusion constant uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned, is that cutoff dependent in any simple sense or? Sorry? Or not? Uh, the divergence of the diffusion constant that you yes. described when with the co-propagating mode. Yeah. Um, is there any simple sense in which that's cutoff dependent or? Cutoff, you mean uh, by in the number of conservation laws or? For example, for, so like the, like the spin diffusion constant in the... Ah, okay. Um, yeah, so um, now uh, we, we haven't dealt with uh, with the divergence and emergence of KPZ using this in uh, in in, uh, in integrable spin chains. Uh, so what I was uh, discussing in the 
in the scope of nonlinear hydrodynamics is the case when you have just a couple of conservation laws and then uh, if you have some diagonal contribution, the diffusion constant will diverge. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, I mean, as you know, I mean, this uh, business with uh, KPZ and spin chain is uh, quite technically involved and uh, uh, yeah, one, one should in principle introduce some cutoffs and uh, um, yeah, can I just just add? So when you have this divergence, at least in in the, with finite number of sufficient laws, you can actually work out a little bit more and bound the super diffusion exponent instead of trying to bound the diffusion constant, which you find you find something divergent. You can uh, find yeah. super diffusion exponent, but you have to use some some kind of Hilbert space construction to do that. I don't know how to do this in in the in the form that Marco was explaining. So yeah. Yeah, so so there is uh, that that's explained in the paper that uh, by Ben, which I showed initially. Other questions?